Although men fish for him, the shark remains a king and is treated accordingly. The slipknot is described as a floral wreath, and the floater a pillow for the animal to rest his head. Now they tell us that if we continue our traditional way of life, we will not go to heaven. But we, the village chiefs, cannot believe that. If we live as we have always lived, our spirit will certainly be with God. But if we don't, it will not. When I am dead and buried, if I have not followed our traditions, God will reject me. They are destroying our customs, and we don't know why. We search for reasons for them being against our traditions, but we cannot find any. Why are they against them? Monotheistic religions don't like these customs because magic is attributed to satanic practices and governments consider them primitive. On Tana, a small island south of Vanuatu, all the men with traditional names consider themselves as magicians. They are trees whose roots are sacred. Their powers come from magic stones, Ocean-dwelling clans possess stones which have control over sea creatures such as the turtle, a sacred animal, which is eaten as a ritual and enables the exchange of magic powers. These exchanges are possible thanks to the shark, who permits man to capture him. As for the turtle, we speak to the shark by addressing his spirit, which lives in the stone. In the secret area where the stones exercise their power, the old village chief passes his knowledge down to his son, who must succeed him as the stone magician. This year, it is you who will go to the men of the land and trade the turtle for a pig. But first, you must know the magic of the stones. The black stone is the sharks, and the white, the turtles. To attract the turtle into the bay, you must turn the white stone towards the earth. Place the black stone of the shark behind, and don't forget the pilot fish. This way the sharks will frighten the turtle and push it towards the shore where you can catch it. If you succeed, it means that the stones have accepted you and that you will become a magician. The next day, the chief's son goes around the bay looking for the precious turtle. Will he succeed? Will he too become a magician? Get 
The old chief is happy. Thanks to the shark spirit's kindness, his son has succeeded. Now the young man has to walk towards the interior of the land, through the mountains, to the village of Yakel, also called the village of customs, because the people who live there have maintained their ancestral way of life. His journey includes a dangerous area, the Yasur volcano. From its entrails at the beginning of time, the god Hunyin spewed out some errant, talkative, and disobedient stones. The earth was born as a result of their wanderings. All this movement, however, tired the stones out. One day, they stopped moving, and out of chaos came peace. Today, the stones no longer speak, but at sunset, they come to life again. Evil and wandering spirits come out and attack men who have not gone home. The men of the sea arrive at the home of the men from the land. The trading of a turtle for a pig is a very important ritual. It renews the alliance between the two clans. Exchanging these prestigious animals and then eating them signifies that the mana, or secret power of the groups living at the waterside, leaves for the mountains, and at the same time, the power of the manbus comes down to the sea. Koran lives in Ambrim, another of Vanuatu's 40 islands. He's recently installed a winch on his traditional boat, which enables him to fish for snapper, a handsome red fish that lives in very deep water. For a while now, Koran has had problems with sharks. They eat all his fish before he can raise them to the surface. For him, there is only one explanation. Someone or something has put a magic spell on him. He has to consult the sorcerers who live in the interior of the island. Ambrim is a mysterious island, known for its very powerful and easily offended sorcerers. Tofor is the most powerful and the most feared. It takes courage for Koran to seek advice from him, since Tofor is not from his village. And his advice, like a trial sentence, has to be followed to the letter. Your way of fishing is new, and the Yarima spirits don't like it. Your reel takes you too far into their space. The sharks that eat your fish are merely the instruments of discontented spirits. In the past, when enemies were about to destroy our clan, the sorcerers combined all their power and carved a breadfruit tree in the shape of a shark. 
They slid inside it, and the trunk came to life. It became a shark and devoured all our enemies. If the sharks are against you today, it's because you have committed an error. You did not think about whether the spirits would let you fish or not. You must ask for their forgiveness. You must make a ceremony and sacrifice a pig. That is the custom. On Bora Bora, one of the most touristic of Polynesian atolls, men like Te Oira like to tell this story. Taoroa, the Polynesian god who created the world, had a beautiful blue shark. The men would swim with him and even let their children climb onto his back. One day, the men got it into their heads that the shark was evil, and they decided to kill him. Two brave brothers were assigned the job. Once they had pierced his head with a spear, Daharoa became furious and reappeared, bringing his beautiful blue shark back to life. Ever since, fearing the wrath of Taharoa, the men respect the shark. Although the shark has become a profitable attraction here, the men have not forgotten the place he occupies in their culture. Teoira recalls that in the past, the shark, by carrying the spirits of the dead, enabled them to become ancestors. Teoira only fishes for sharks when it's absolutely necessary, and occasionally likes to repeat the movements his ancestors used to capture them. In addition to being both prey and predator, the shark is also a social partner, a companion, a god, and perhaps a dispenser of justice. If, for example, man is attacked by a shark, man is to blame and not the shark. Oceanic people are never indifferent to the shark. For them, the shark is not looked upon negatively as he is in Western societies. For a long time, Western man never ventured out on the high seas and confined himself to the coastal waters. All existing ancient rock drawings dealing with the shark represent him with ambiguity. The Bible takes no account of him. The first mention of him is undoubtedly in Babylonian mythology. The monster Bull, which literally means the devourer who swallowed up young girls, and Histuba, a brave hero who killed him, thus saving the coastal population from this scourge. Later, in the 5th century BC, the renowned Greek historian Herodotus recounts what happened to part of Darius's fleet near Mount Athos. It was thrown against the reefs, and the sailors died, not by drowning, in spite of a horrible storm, but by being seized and eaten by monsters with sharp teeth. The Romans knew more about sharks than the Greeks, and even distinguished the most dangerous species. When Pliny the Elder, in the first century AD, says that sea dogs can be threatening, he is referring to small sharks which are hard to identify, but which can threaten fishermen by attacking them at the ankles or injuring their groin. 